So the topic today is dynamic programming. Um, the term programming in this, um, in the in the name of this term, uh, doesn't refer to computer programming. Okay, programming is an old word that means any tabular method for accomplishing something. And so you'll hear about linear programming, okay, dynamic programming. Neither of those, even though we now incorporate those algorithms in computer programs, originally computer programming, you were given a data sheet and you'd put one line per uh, line of code as a tabular method for telling, giving the machine instructions as to what to do, okay? So the term programming is older. Of course, now conventionally when you say programming, you mean software, computer programming. But that wasn't always the case, and these terms uh, continue in the literature. So, um, so dynamic programming is a design technique uh, like other design techniques we've seen, such as divide and conquer. Okay, so it's a way of solving a class of problems rather than a particular algorithm or something. So we're going to work through this for the example of the so-called longest common subsequence problem, sometimes called LCS, okay, uh, which is a problem that comes up in a variety of contexts, and it's particularly important in computational biology, where you have long DNA strings and you're trying to find commonalities between two strings, okay, one which may be a genome that, that uh, and one may be various, um, uh, when people do, what is that thing called where they do the evolutionary comparisons? The evolutionary trees, yeah, but there's, phylogenic. right, right, exactly. What is it? Phylogenic. phylogenic trees, there you go. Okay, phylogenic trees, good. So here's the problem. So you're given two sequences, X going from one to M, and Y running from one to N. You want to find a longest sequence common to both. Okay, and here I say A, not the, although it's common to talk about the longest common subsequence, usually longest common subsequence isn't unique. There can be several different subsequence that tie for that. However, you know, people tend to, it's one of the sloppinesses that people will say the, I will try to say a, uh, unless it's unique, but I may slip as well because it's just such a common thing to, uh, to just talk about the, even though it's, even though there might be multiple. So here's an example, suppose X is this sequence. Y is this sequence. So what is a longest common subsequence of those two sequences? So you can just eyeball it. Length two. Anybody have one longer? A, excuse me. B D B. B D B. B D B. B B A B. B B A B. B D A B. Anything longer? B B A B. That's the longest one. Is there another one? 
Just the same one? Is there another one that that ties? B C A B. B C A B. Another one? B C B A. Yeah, there are a bunch of them. All of length four. There isn't one of length five. Okay? We're actually gonna come up with an algorithm that if it's correct, which we're gonna show it's correct, guarantees there isn't one of length five. Okay? So all those are we can say any one of these is the longest common subsequence of x and y. We tend to use it this way using functional notation. But it's not a uh, it's not a function, it's really a relation. So we'll say that something is an LCS when really we mean it's an element, if you will, of the set of longest common subsequences. Okay, once again, it's classic abusive notation. As long as we know what we mean, it's okay to abuse notation. Okay, which can't be is misuse it. But abuse, yeah. Okay, make it so it's easy to, to deal with. So you have to know what's going on underneath. Okay. Okay, um, so let's, um, let's see. So there's a fairly simple brute force algorithm for uh, solving this problem. And that is, let's just check every, maybe some of you did this in, in your heads, every subsequence of x from 1 to n to C if it's also a subsequence of y of 1 to n. So just take every subsequence that you can get here, check it to see if it's in there. Okay? Let's analyze that. check, so if I give you a subsequence of x, how long does it take me to check whether it is in fact a subsequence of y? So I give you something like um, you know, BCAB, how long does it take me to check to see if it's a subsequence of y? Length of y, which is yeah, order n. Okay, and how do you do it? Yeah, you just scan. As soon as you hit the first character that matches, great. Now, if you will, recursively see whether the suffix of your string matches the suffix of the uh, of x. Okay, and so you're just simply walking down the the. Uh, tree to see if it matches, you're walking down the string to see if it matches. Okay, then the second thing is how many, then how many subsequences of x are there? Two to the n, x is, goes from one to m, two to the m. Subsequences of x, okay, two to the m. There are two to the m subsequences of x. Okay, one way to see that, you say, well, how many subsequences are there of something there? If I consider a bit vector of length m, okay, that's one or zero, and just every position where there's a one, I take out, that identifies an element that I'm going to take out, okay, then that gives me a mapping from each subsequence of x to uh, uh, from each bit vector to a, to a different subsequence of x. Now, of course, you could have matching characters there, but in the worst case, all the characters are different. Okay? And so every one of those will be a unique 
subsequent. So each bit vector of length m corresponds to the subsequent. That's a generally good trick to know. So the worst case running time of this uh, method is order n times q to the m, okay, which is, since it's m is in the exponent, is exponential prime. And there's a technical term that we use when something is exponential prime. Slow, good. Okay, very good. Okay, slow. Okay. So this is really bad. <laughs> this take a long time to crank out how long the uh, longest common subsequence is because there's so many subsequences. Okay. So we're going to now go through a process of developing a far more efficient algorithm for this problem. Okay, and we're actually going to go through several stages. The first one is to go through a simplification stage. Okay, and what we're going to do is look at simply the length. of the longest, longest common sequence of x and y. And then what we'll do is extend the algorithm to find the longest common subsequence itself. Okay, so we're going to look at the length. So simplify the problem, if you will, to just try to compute the length. What's nice is the length is unique, okay? There's only one length that's going to be the longest, okay? And what we'll do is just focus on this problem of computing the length, and then what we'll do is we can back up from that and figure out how what actually is the subsequence that realizes that length, okay? And that'll be a big simplification because we don't have to keep track of a lot of different possibilities at every stage. We just have to keep track of the one number, which is the length. So it sort of reduces it to a numerical problem. We'll adopt the following notation. It's pretty standard notation, but I just want to, if I put absolute values around the string, it denotes, or a, or a sequence, it denotes the length of the sequence S. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing we're going to do is actually we're going to, um, which takes a lot more insight when you come up with a problem like this, and in some sense ends up being the um, uh, uh, the hardest part of designing a good dynamic programming algorithm for any uh, problem, which is we're going to actually look not at all um, subsequences of x and y, but just prefixes okay we're just going to look at prefixes and we're going to show how we can express okay the length of a longest common subsequence of prefixes in terms of each other. In particular, we're going to define C of ij to be the length of the longest common subsequence of the prefix of x going from 1 to i and y of going to 1 to j. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate C i j for all i j. Okay, and if we do that, how then do we solve the problem of longest common subsequence of x and y? How 
how do we solve the longest common subtotal? Suppose we've solved this for all i and j. How then do we compute the length of the longest common subsequent of x and y? Yeah, CMN, that's all. Okay? So then C of M comma N is just equal to the longest common subsequence of X and Y. Because that's just if I go from one to M and one to N, I'm done. Okay? And so it's going to turn out that what we want to do is figure out how to um, express the uh, CMN in general CIJ in terms of other CIJ. So let's see how we do that. Okay, so our theorem is going to say that CIJ is just says that if the i-th character matches the j-th character, then c of i, uh, i-th character of x matches the j-th character of y, then c of i-j is just c of i minus 1, j minus 1 plus 1. And if they don't match, then it's either going to be, it's going to be the longer of c of i, j minus 1, and c of i minus 1, j. Okay. So that's what we're, we're going to prove, and that's going to give us a way of relating the calculation of a given CIJ, as you can see, to values that are, that are strictly smaller, okay? That is, at least one of the arguments is smaller of the two arguments, okay? And that's going to give us a way of, of being able then to, um, to understand how to build, how, how to calculate CIJ. So let's prove this theorem. So we'll start with a case where XI equals Y of J. And so let's draw a picture here. We have X here. my sequence x, which I'm sort of drawing as this elongated box, sequence y, and I'm saying that xi and yj, those are equal. Okay. So, Let's see what that means. Okay, so let's let v of 1 to k be, in fact, the longest common subsequence of x of 1 to i, y of 1 to j, where 
of ij is equal to k. Okay, so the longest common subsequence of x and y is uh, of x of 1 to i and y of 1 to j has some value, let's call it k. And so let's say that we have some sequence which realizes that. Okay, we'll call it z. Okay, so then can somebody tell me what z of k is? Z of K here. Yeah, it's actually equal to X of I, which is also equal to Y of J. Why is that? Why couldn't it be some other value? So you got the you got the right idea. So the idea is suppose that the sequence didn't include these this element here as the last element, the longest common subsequence. Okay. So then it includes a bunch of values in here and a bunch of values in here, same values, but doesn't include this or this. Well, then I could just tack on this extra character and make it be longer. Make it be k plus one, because these two match. Okay, so if the sequence ended before, we could just extend it, tacking on x i. It would be fairly simple to just tack on xi. Okay, so if, if that's the case, then <coughs> if I look at z going 1 up to uh, k minus 1, that's certainly a common sequence of x of i up to, excuse me, of 1 up to i minus 1. And y of 1 up to j minus 1. Okay, because this is a longest common sequence. Z is a longest common sequence is from of x of 1 to i, y of 1 to j. And we know what the last character is. It's just xi, or equivalently yj. So therefore, everything except the last character must at least be a common sequence of x i of 1 to i minus 1, y of 1 to j minus 1. Everybody with me? Okay, it must be a common sequence. Now, what do you also suspect? What do you also suspect about z of 1 to k? It's a common sequence of these two. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's a longest common sequence. Okay? Right, so that's what we claim. Z of 1 up to k minus 1 is in fact a longest common subsequence of x of 1 to i minus 1 and y of 1 to j minus 1. Okay. So let's prove that, that claim. So we'll just have a little diversion to prove the claim. Okay. So suppose that w is a longer common sequence. 
that is that the length of w is bigger than k minus 1. Okay? So suppose you have a longer common sequence than z of 1 to k minus 1. So it's got to have length that's bigger than k minus 1 if it's longer. Okay? And now what we do is we use a classic argument that you're going to see multiple times, not just this week, which it will be important for this week, but through several lectures uh, hence. It's called a cut and paste argument. So the idea is, let's take a look at W concatenated with uh, that last character, Z of K. So this is string Uh, okay, so that's just my terminology for string concatenation. Okay, so I take whatever I claimed was a longer common subsequence, and I um, uh, and I concatenate z of k to it. Okay, so that is certainly a common sequence of x of uh, 1 to uh, i minus 1, big I, and y of 1 to j. And it has l length bigger than k. Because it's basically, what is its length? Okay, it's big. The length of W is bigger than k minus one. I add one character, so this combination here now has length bigger than k. Okay, and that's a contradiction. Thereby proving the claim. So I'm simply saying. I claim this. Suppose you had a longer one. Well, let me show if I had a longer common sequence for the first, uh, for the prefixes where we dropped the character from both strings. If it was longer there, well, it would have made the whole thing longer. So that can't be. So therefore, this must be a uh, uh, longest common subsequence. Okay. Questions? Okay. Questions? Because you're going to need to be able to do this kind of proof, like ad nauseum almost. Okay. So if there are any questions, let me let them at me. People. Okay. So so now what we have established is that. Z one through K is the longest common subsequence of uh, the two strings when we uh, drop the two prefixes when we drop the last character. So thus we have that C of I minus one, J minus one is equal to what? What's C of I minus one, J minus one? K minus one. Thank you. Let's move on with the class, right? Okay. Okay. Which implies that C of I J is just equal to C of I minus one J minus one plus one. So it's fairly straightforward if you think about what's going on there. But it's not always as straightforward in some problems as it is for a longest common subsequence. The idea is, you know, the, the um, well, we'll um, so I'm not going to go through the other cases. They're similar.
but in fact we've hit on one of the two hallmarks of dynamic programming. So by hallmarks I mean when you see this kind of structure in a problem, there's a good chance that dynamic programming is going to work, okay, as a strategy. And the high, the dynamic programming hallmark is the following. is number one, and that is this property of optimal substructure. Okay, what that says is an optimal solution to a problem and by this we really mean problem instance, but it gets tedious to keep saying problem instance. A problem is generally in computer science viewed as a, um, as having an infinite number of instances typically, okay, where, which is a particular, so sorting is a problem, okay, a sorting instance is a particular input, okay, so we're really talking about problem instances, but I'm just going to say problem, okay. So when you have an optimal solution to a problem contains optimal solutions to subproblems. Okay, and that's worth drawing a box around because it's so important. Okay. So here, for example, okay, if Z is a longest common subsequence of X and Y, okay, then any prefix of Z is a longest common subsequence of a prefix of X and a prefix of y. Okay. So this is basically what it says. I look at the problem and I can see that there is optimal substructure going on. Okay, in this case, and and the idea is that almost always there's it means that there's a cut and paste argument you can do to demonstrate that. Okay, that if, if, if the uh, substructure were not optimal, then you'd be able to find uh, a, uh, a better solution to the overall problem using cut and paste. Okay. Okay, so this theorem now gives us a strategy for being able to compute longest common subsequence. So I'm going to ignore base cases in this. If
is basically just implementing this theorem. Okay. So it's either the longest common subsequence if the if they match, it's the longest common subsequence of one of the prefix that where you drop that character from both strings and add one, because that's the matching one. Or you drop a character from x, and it's the longest common subsequence of that. Or you drop a character from y, whichever one of those is longer. That ends up being longest common subsequence. So which is the what's the worst case for this uh, for this program? What's going to happen in the worst case? Which of these two clauses is going to cause us more headache? <laughs> the second clause. Why the second clause? Yeah, you're doing two LCS subcalculations here. Here you're only doing one. Not only that, but you get to decrement both uh, indices. Whereas here, you've got to, you've basically got to, you only get to decrement one index and got to calculate two of them. So that's going to generate the tree. So in the worst case, x of i is not equal to x of j for all i and j. So let's draw a recursion tree for this program to sort of get an understanding as to what's going on. Help us uh, and I'm going to do it with m equals 7 and n equals 6. Okay. So we start out the top with my two indices being 7 and 6. And then in the worst case, we have to execute these. So this is going to end up being 6, 6 and 7, 5 for indices after the first call. And then this guy is going to split and he's going to be produce 5, 6 here, decrement the first index, i. And then if I keep going down here, we're going to get 4, 6, 5, 5. And these guys keep extending. Here I get 6, 5, 5, 5, 6, 4. Okay. Over here, I'm going to get. Um, Decrement the first index, 6, 5. I get 5, 5, 6, 4. And these guys keep going down. And over here, I get 7, 4. And then we get 6, 4, 7, 3. And those keep going down. So it keeps just building this tree out. OK. So. Um, What's the height of this tree? Not of this one for the particular value of m and n, but in terms of m and n. What's the height of this tree? Yeah. It's the max of m and n. Uh, you got the right, uh, it's theta of the max. It's not the max. The max would be, in this case, you're saying it has height 7. But I think you can still see, for example, along a path like this, that, in fact, I've only, after going three levels, reduced m plus n. Good. Very good. m plus n. So height here is m plus n. Okay, and it's binary, so the height that implies the work 
is exponential in M and N. If all that work, and are we any better off than the brute force algorithm? Not really. And our technical term for this is slow. Okay? And we like speed. Okay, we like fast. Okay. But I'm sure that some of you have observed something interesting about this tree. Yeah, there's a lot of repeated work here. Right? There's a lot of repeated work. In particular, this whole subtree and this whole subtree, okay, they're the same. That's the same subtree, same subproblem that you're solving. Okay, you can even see over here, there's even similarity between this whole subtree and this whole subtree. Okay, so there's lots of repeated work. Okay, and one thing is if you want to do things fast, don't keep doing the same thing. Okay? Don't keep doing the same thing. When you find you're repeating something, figure out a way of not doing it. So that brings up our second hallmark for dynamic programming. And that's a property called overlapping subproblem. Recursive solution contains many, excuse me, contains a small number of distinct problems repeated many times. And once again, this is important enough to put a box around. I don't put boxes around too many things. Maybe I should put more boxes around things. This is definitely one to put a box around. Okay? So, for example, here, so here we have a recursive solution. How many, this tree is exponential in size. It's 2 to the m plus n in height, you know, in, in size, in, in uh, the total number of, of uh, problems, if I actually implement it like that. But how many distinct subproblems are there? m times n, okay? So longest common subsequence. The subproblem space contains m times n distinct subproblems. Okay? M n is a small number compared with. Uh, 2 to the m plus n, or 2 to the n, or 2 to the m, or whatever. Okay, this is small. Okay, because for each subproblem, it's characterized by an i and a j, and i goes from 1 to m, and j goes from 1 to n. Okay, there aren't that many different subproblems, it's just the product of the two. So here's an approved algorithm, which is often a good way to solve it. It's an algorithm called a memoization algorithm. And 
this is memoization, not memorization. Because what you're going to do is make a little memo whenever you solve a subproblem. Make a little memo that says, I solved this already. And if ever you're asked for it, rather than recalculating it, say, oh, I see that. I did that before. Here's the answer. Okay. So here's the code. It's very similar to that code. So it basically keeps a table around of CIJ. It says if, and what we do is we check. If the entry for CIJ is nil, we haven't computed it, then we compute it. And how do we compute it? just the same way we did before. This whole part here, okay, is exactly what we have had before. It's the same as before. And then we just return CIJ. So we don't bother to keep recalculating. Okay, so. If it's nil, we calculate it. Otherwise, we just return it. Okay? It's not calculated, calculate and return it. Otherwise, just return it. Okay, pretty pretty straightforward code. Okay. tricky thing is, how much time does it take to execute this? It takes a little bit of thinking. Okay, why is that? Yeah, but I have to look up CIJ a bunch of I might call CIJ a bunch of times. When I'm doing this, I'm still calling it recursively. Yeah. So you have to, you have to, so each recursive call is going to look at, in the worst case, say, is going to look at, at um, uh, uh, the max of these two things. So this is going to involve a recursive call and a lookup, but this might go on, you know, this might take a fair amount of effort to calculate. I mean, you're right, and your intuition is right. Let's see if we can get a more precise argument why this is taking order n times n. What's going on here? Because not every time I call this is it going to just take me a constant amount of work to do this. Sometimes it's going to take me a lot of work. Sometimes it'll be, sometimes I'll get lucky and I return it. It's just that your intuition is dead on. It's dead on, just we need a little more articulate explanation so that everybody's on board. Try again? Okay. Good. 
At most three times, yeah. Okay, so that's one way to look at it, yep. There's another way to look at it that, that kind of what you're looking at, what you're expressing there is an amortized, a bookkeeping way of, of uh, looking at this. Is what's the amortized cost? You could say what's the amortized cost of calculating one of these, where basically whenever I call it, I'm going to charge a constant amount for looking up so I can get to look up whatever is in here to call the things. But if it, in fact, so, th so in some sense, this charge here of calling it and returning it, et cetera, I charge that to the got to my caller. Okay, so I charge these lines and this line to the caller, and I charge the rest of these lines to the CIJ element. And then the point is that every caller basically only ends up being charged for a constant amount of stuff. Okay, to calculate one CIJ, it's only an amortized constant amount of stuff that I'm charging to that calculation of I and J, to that calculation of I and J. Okay, so you can view it in terms of amortized analysis being a bookkeeping argument. It just says, let me charge enough to uh, enough to calculate my own, do, do all my own local things, plus enough to look up the value in the next level and get it returned. Okay, and then if it has to go off and calculate, well, that's okay, because that's all being charged to a different IJ at that point. So every cell only t costs me a constant amount of time. They're order MN cells, total of order MN. Okay, constant work per entry. Okay, and you can sort of use an amortized analysis to argue that. How much space does it take? We haven't usually looked at space, but here we're going to start looking at space. That turns out for some of these algorithms to be really important. How much space do I need? Storage space. Yeah, also n times n. Okay, to store the CIJ table. Okay, the rest storing x and y, okay, that's just m plus n, so that's negligible, but mostly I need the uh, space n times n. So this memoization type algorithm is a, is a really good strategy in programming for many things where when you have the same parameters, you're going to get the same result. It doesn't work if in programs where you have a side effect necessarily, that is when you're when your uh, the calculation for a given set of parameters might be different on each call, but for pl something which is essentially uh, like a functional programming type of environment, then if you calculate it once, you can look it up, and uh, and so this is very helpful, um, but it takes a fair amount of space, and it also doesn't proceed in a very orderly way. So there's another strategy for doing exactly the same calculation in a bottom-up way. And that's what we call dynamic programming. Okay. The idea is to compute the table bottom-up. We'll just use oh, actually I think what I'm gonna do is use this board. So here's the idea. What we're going to do is look at the CIJ table and realize that there's actually an orderly way of filling in the table. This was sort of a top-down is memoization, okay? But there's actually a way we can do it bottom-up. So here's the idea. So let's make our table. Let me put. Okay, 
so there's x, and then and there's y. And I'm going to initialize the empty string. I didn't cover the uh, base cases for um, for uh, c i j, but c of zero, meaning a prefix with no elements in it, that the prefix of that with anything else, the length is zero. Okay, so that's basically how I'm going to bound the the borders here. And now what I can do is just use my formula, which I've conveniently erased up there, okay, to compute what is the longest common subsequence, length of the longest common su subsequence from, uh, uh, from this character in Y and this character in X up to this character. So here, for example, they don't match, so it's the maximum of these two values. Here they do match. Okay, so it says it's one plus the value here. And I'm going to draw a line. Whenever I get a match, I'm going to draw a line like that, indicating that I had that first case, the case where they, they had a good match. Okay. And so all I'm doing is applying that recursive formula from the theorem that we proved. So here, it's basically the, they don't match, so it's the maximum of those two. Here, they match, so it's one plus that guy. Here they don't match, so it's basically the maximum of these two. Here they don't match, so it's the maximum. Here they match, so it's one plus that guy. Everybody understand how I filled out that first row? Okay, well then you guys can help. Okay, so this one is what? Just call it out. Zero, good. One, because it's the maximum. One. Two, right? This one now gets from there. Two. Two. Okay. Here. Zero, one, because it's the maximum of those two. Two, 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 good. One, one, two. Two, two, three, three. One, two, three, and I'll get that line. And our answer, four. Okay, so this is blindingly fast code if you code this up. Okay, because it gets to use the fact that modern machines, in particular, do very well on regular strides through memory. So if you're just plowing through memory across like this, okay, and your two-dimensional array is stored in that order, which it is in uh, otherwise, you'd go this way. It's stored in that order. Okay, it can you can just really this can really fly in terms of uh, 
uh, the speed of the calculation. Okay, so what, how much time did this take us to do this? Yeah, order mn, beta mn. Okay, beta mn. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about space in just a minute. Okay, so hold that question. Good question. Good question. Already, wow, good. Okay, how do I now um, figure out? Remember, we had the simplification. We're going to just calculate the length. Okay, turns out I can actually now figure out a uh, a particular sequence that matches it. And basically, I do that. I can reconstruct the longest common subsequence by tracing backwards. So essentially, I start here. Here I have a choice because this one was dependent on, since it doesn't have a bar here, it was dependent on one of these two. So let me go this way. Okay, and now I have a diagonal element here. So what I'll do is simply mark the, uh, the character okay, that, uh, that appeared in those um, positions as I go this way. And I have three here. And now let me keep going three here. And now I have another one. So that means this character gets selected. And then I go up to here, okay, and then up to here. And now I go diagonally again, which means that this character is selected. And then I go to here. And then I go here. And then get to here, and this character is selected. So here's my longest common subsequence. And this was just one path back. I could have gone a path like this and gotten a different longest common subsequence. Okay? So that simplification of just saying, look, let me just, you know, run backwards and figure it out, that's that's actually pretty good. Okay, because it means that I I by just uh, by just calculating the value then figuring out these back pointers to, to let me reconstruct it is a fairly simple process. Okay, if I'd had to think about that to begin with, it would have been a much bigger mess. Okay, so the space I just mentioned was order mn, because we still need the table. Okay, so you can actually do the min of M and N. Okay, to get to your question. How do you do the min of M and N? Diagonal strikes won't give you N of M and N. That'll give you the sum of M and N. So going in strikes, maybe I'm not quite sure I know what you mean. So you're saying so what's the order I would do here? So I would start, I'd do this one first. Then which one would I do? This, this one, this one? And then this one, this one, this one, like this. That's a perfectly good order. Okay. And so you're saying then, so how am I keeping, so I'm keeping the diagonal there all the time. So you're saying the length of the diagonal is the min of m and n. I think that's right. Okay, there's, a, there's another way you can do it, it's a little bit more straightforward, which is you compare m to n, whichever is smaller. Well, first of all, let's just do, if just with this existing algorithm, if I just simply did row by row, I don't need more than the previous row. Okay, I just need one row at a time. So I can go ahead and compute just one row because once I've computed 
the succeeding row, the first row, is unimportant. And in fact, I don't even need the whole row. All I need is just the current row that I'm on plus one ele two elements of the previous row plus the end of the previous row. So I use a prefix of this row, then two, then an extra two elements, and then the suffix of this row. So it's actually, you can do it with um, one row plus order one element. And then I can do it either running vertically or running horizontally, whichever one is gives me the smaller space. Okay, and it might be that your diagonal trick would work there too. I have to think about that. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So we can do the calculation of the length in run row plus order one element. Okay, and our exercise, okay, and this is a hard exercise, okay, so, so, uh, but, a, but a good one to do is to do small space and allow you to reconstruct the LCX, because the naive way that we were just doing it it's not clear how you would go backwards from that because you've lost the information. Okay, so this is actually a very interesting and tricky problem, and it turns out it succumbs, of all things, to divide and conquer. Okay, rather than some more straightforward tabular thing. Okay, so very good uh, practice, for example, for the upcoming take-home quiz, okay, which is all design and cleverness type quiz. Okay, so this is a good one for people to take on. Okay. So, so this is basically the tabular method that's called dynamic programming. Okay, memoization is not dynamic programming, even though it's related, it's memoization. Okay. And we're going to see a whole bunch of other problems that succumb to dynamic programming uh, approaches. So it's a very cool method, okay? Uh, and on the homework, so let me just mention the homework again. On the homework, we're going to look at a problem called the edit distance problem. Edit distance is you're given two strings, and you can imagine that you're typing at a keyboard with one of the strings there, and what you have to do is by doing inserts and deletes and replaces and moving the cursor around, you've got to transform one string to the next. And each of those operations has a cost, and your job is to minimize the cost of transforming the one string into the other. This actually turns out also to be useful for um, computational biology applications. And in fact, there have been um, editors, uh, screen editors, text editors, that implement algorithms of this nature in order to minimize the number of characters that have to be sent as I.O. Um, uh, in and out of the, of the system. So the warning is you better get going on your programming on problem one on the homework today, if at all possible, because whenever I sign programming, since we don't do that as sort of a r routine thing, I'm just concerned for some people that they will not be able to get things like the input and output to work and so forth. We have example problems and such on the uh, website uh, and uh, we also have, um, you can write it in any language you want, okay, including MATLAB, Python, you know, whatever your favorite uh, thing. The solutions will be written in um, Java and Python, okay. So the fastest solutions are likely to be written in C. Okay. You can also do it in assembly language if you if you care to. <laughs> you laugh. I used to program, be an assembly language programmer. That was uh, back in back in the days of yore. <laughs> okay, so I do encourage people to get started on this uh, because um, because this is. Uh, let me mention the other thing is that this particular problem on this problem set is an absolutely mandatory uh, problem. Okay, so all the problems are mandatory, but as you know, you can skip them and it doesn't hurt you too much if you only skip one or two. This one you skip hurts big time. One letter grade. Must be done. 